Okay, I would like to mention just a few things before I talk about the uh, topics for today. So I reorganized the uh, structure of the section page a little bit just to make hopefully yourself and myself a little bit easier. So if you go to the course website, which I gave you the link about last time, if you go there, I used to post all the slides on this particular page. I kind of moved them together with the recordings. So you just have to go under lecture materials, just go to this page over here, and then you will see that 3311. Okay, so you can see uh, recordings, the blackboard, well, basically iPad, and also any sample code I made available, and also those lecture slides. So whenever you see incomplete, you can download them, maybe just don't print them yet, because I, I might still do some revision, typos, or additional slides. Okay, any, um, before I ask you for any questions, and also if you go to the course Moodle page, if you log into the Moodle, not the York University Moodle, the Lausanne.learn, the Moodle, learn the Lausanne, and make sure you really download this PDF here for the textbook, because if you look at the slides, it tells you you are supposed to read chapter 11 already. Please start right away, okay? That's the only required textbook for this course, and it has been made available to you for free. And uh, I also updated the instructions for installing the iPhone Studio, especially uh, for those of you who are still struggling with installing iPhone Studio, there is a last resort option. So we have created a virtual machine image that can be run by VirtualBox, which is completely free. And if you download the image followed by following the link, just uh, you have to log in uh, by your York Passport uh, login, and then you can download the uh, image and use it. The image itself has the iPhone Studio 17.05, the latest version. And this is a warning I want to give to you. Even though for the class exercises, I really encourage you to bring your laptop have the, uh, with the iPhone Studio installed. However, whenever, before you submit anything for grading, please make sure you always test your software on the lab machines upstairs because that's kind of the same platform that we're gonna test your code. Make sure everything just runs well, just in case, okay? But how you do your assignments, where you do it, where you do your labs, it doesn't really matter. It can be your home machine, can be the labs, doesn't matter, okay? And for lab number one, starting from next Wednesday, it will be for grading. So I would say between now and until next Wednesday, try your best to really get familiar with the syntax of IFO. I prepared some slides for you to really talk, talk about the trickiest syntax you might find as a Java programmer, okay? So I'll talk about most, most of them today, hopefully, if we got time. Otherwise, you can just read the slides yourself. It's basically very straightforward. And uh, for the lab test, of course, you will be given, maybe uh, you can bring a cheat sheet if you like. You can uh, remind yourself all the uh, iPhone syntax is, uh, if you like. But I would say really try to get familiar with syntax, syntax as soon as possible. Okay. okay, let's now continue with our lecture from last time. I would like to just recap very quickly what we have achieved last time. So the reason that I started our first problem with Java is because the main idea we want to learn in this course is called design by contracts. It is a mechanism that can be supported by many, many of the languages. It can be c Sharp, can be C++, can be Java, and can be iPhone. So why do we choose iPhone? Because for this course here, we are more concerned about if you can really learn the design by contract idea first before you apply that to C++ or Java. However, learning design by contract as a beginner using Java right away, as we can see, you will get distracted by so many assertions, try and catch, and exceptions. Those are the unnecessary bits that should pollute your mind when you're learning design by contracts. So that's really the rationale. It's not because we like iPhone. It's because iPhone is really the best learning tool for you to learn uh, design by contracts. So that's why last time I started our lecture with, I talked about client supplier, Right? So we talk about benefits, we talk about obligation of client supplier, so please make sure you really understand uh, really the big picture, design by contracts. And we talk about if you are in the context of object-oriented programming, so whenever you're trying to make a method call, so you will have a client supplier relationship over here. So let's say in the context of microwave user, we are trying to make use of the service that is provided by microwave. So in this case, the microwave user is the client, and the microwave is the supplier, right? Client supplier. 
And always, client has some obligation to make sure before I use the service, I must meet certain criteria to make sure I'm going to reuse the service in a reasonable way. That is the so-called precondition, which we talked about last time. I'll review that very quickly. Another thing which we're going to talk about, which is something new today. If the clients follow the instructions properly, and then the supplier should guarantee the service should be provided in a satisfactory way. For example, if I, if I'm a, me as a client, if I give you a sorted array, and you are the supplier of binary search, if I really give you a sorted array, you have to guarantee to me, you gotta give me back the correct search, right? If I didn't give you a sorted array, then the contract is already broken. I should be the person to blame the clients. Okay? So you should always be clear about who, who to be blamed and who's, uh, who's the benefits, who's the beneficiary. Okay. Any questions about the method call over here, how we can tell the client and supplier? Okay. So for any of the programming languages that support object orientation, they all use the dot notation. So this is not specific to iPhone or Java. So okay. So many of the ideas we teach, even though they might be specifying iPhone later, but they are applicable to all the other languages. Okay. Okay, so we talk about client supplier, and then, so that's the small problem that we are trying to solve. We only focus on requirements one and two. We talk about the other four, they happen to be even more complicated to be encoded in Java, which I will show you next week as we talk more about iPhone. Okay, I will talk, I'll go back to this example in a bit. Okay, maybe next week. So now, today we will try to finish requirements one and two. Let's review. This is the very first version that we have. Sorry, let me fix the slides. It's a little bit. Okay. So we talk about this. Okay. Do it again. Okay, this is version one. So version one over here, we don't have any notion of contracts, which means, for example, if a supplier, he is trying to withdraw minus a million dollars, in this case, both sides should be blamed. First of all, if I'm going to use the withdrawal, I'm trying to pass a negative amount to be withdrawn, so I am the side to be blamed. On the other hand, the supplier for withdrawal also has to be blamed. Why? Because it doesn't make it clear that there's a precondition that you should obey as a client. So both sides should be blamed. Remember the principle I said to you, for good design, if anything goes wrong, there's gotta be exactly one side that has to be blamed. Cannot be both the client and the supplier. It's gotta be either the client or the supplier, okay? So once we add a precondition to this method here, which is in version two, if you're trying to pass a negative amount to withdraw again, it will be that you will have some precondition exceptions thrown, in which case there will be an error there will be a report. So that would be a better design. Okay, so that's about the problematic scenario that we went over last time, and that's about version one. And for version two, we talk about ideas about preconditions. Preconditions are basically the assumptions that a supply can make about how well behaved the clients might be to use their service, okay? So that's really the benefits for the supplier. I don't really have to implement a very magic microwave you know, to heat the uh, explosive safely, right? That's just the example we used last time. Okay, for version two, we introduced the preconditions. And this one thing that we talked about last time, if you refer to the uh, notes from last time, we talk about the uh, exceptions we have in Java. It's not exactly what we mean by preconditions. For example, Let's talk about this method here. Let me just uh, highlight that again. Let's talk about this divide method over here. If you are trying to divide two numbers, x by y, in this case, if you think in terms of exceptions, you will throw an exception called divide division by zero exception if y is equal to zero. That's how you think of it, which means under what circumstances should I report an error? However, in decide by contract, the way we think about preconditions, we think more positively. We think about, in order for me to do division, what should the clients meet? What should the client satisfy before I can do the division? So that's exactly the logical negation of that, right? So you can think about over here, the precondition here. We say that in order for me to do the division, the y cannot be zero, in which case I can proceed. Yes? I am. 
Oh, thank you so much. But that's not something new. Guys, please, make, every time you see I'm using Apple Pen and then you don't see anything on the screen, please let me know. Okay? But you didn't miss anything, just from previous notes. So I was talking about this divide method here. And I'm also talking about the precondition here. Okay? That's something we have already covered. Any question about to say exceptions are logical negations of preconditions? Again, recap. For precondition, you think positively. For exceptions, you think negatively. Okay? Think about this kind of issue. And then if you really got trouble, please make use of my office hours. OK, uh, let me just go back to the slides. Nothing new here. So now in version 3, we are going to add exceptions somehow will approximate preconditions. Somehow, so that's why I use the word approximate, because they are not exactly the same. So over here, you can see the thing we changed was, for example, for the constructor here, when you are trying to pass a balance to initialize the account, we simply say, sorry, let me just go back to there for the precondition. Version 2, over here. Kind of went a little bit too far. OK, over here. So if you look at for version 2, if you have the uh, account uh, constructed over here, you're passing a balance as an initial balance. We're saying if the balance is going to be negative, which means you're going to create an account that's going to have negative balance, which will violate requirement number one, in which case you should, you should throw an exception. So that's how we encode the preconditions. Okay? That's about version two. But we say that sometimes there might be some missing cases for your precondition. For example, let me just go back to this code over here. Now, let's focus on this particular precondition or exception scenario over here. We say that to withdraw some certain amount, you want to make sure the current balance is strictly less than the amount. If that's the case, that means you're going to result in some negative balance. So you're going to throw the exception. But now there's a missing case over here, as we said. What if the amount is exactly equal to the balance? Right? Imagine this. So now let me just make it clear to you. Okay, now you do have it. Okay, so now think about this scenario here. So here we say the exception scenario that we are defining is, so let's say withdraw. Okay, so one of the exception is, we say exception if we have the amount, okay, let me just double check, I don't want to make any mistake, it's the balance is less than the amount, okay. Balance is less than the amount. If you find it a little bit difficult to, uh, to picture this, why don't we try example very quickly. What about example here? If the balance at the moment is actually 100, the amount you're trying to withdraw is equal to 150. In this case, if you try to plug in the numbers, 100 over here, and then you got 150. 100 less than 150, true or false? True. If that's true, that means we should throw this exception here, right? That's how the uh, precondition is violated. Now, there's a missing case over here. Let's think about this case. What if the balance is actually equal to 100, okay? And then the amount is equal to exactly the balance, okay? So now, what's going to happen to that equation there? You got 100 less than 100. False, don't you agree? False, which means we are not going to throw the exception. However, when you are trying to withdraw 100 from 100, what you will get is you will get a zero balance. And zero balance should not be allowed, according to requirement number one. Balance should always be positive. However, this illegal scenario here will not be caught by the precondition. Okay? Illegal, but not caught by the precondition. 
So that means sometimes the pick condition might miss something, okay, in this particular example. Any question about this before I move on? It's quite important, okay? Of course, there are different ways for you to fix this. One way to do it, one way, you can simply say, so I will say fix number one. Change the, pre, uh, change the exception condition. Change the exception condition to, what would you suggest? Thank you, yes, exactly. Yeah, we're including that missing case. So that'll be balance less than or equal to the amount. Okay, that's one way to fix it. However, I don't want to go that way because I want to illustrate to you another concept. That's possible way. That's another possible. That's one possible way to do it. And you might find this related to one of the exercises of your lab number zero. Okay? But anyway, let's focus on this particular example. Fix number two. Fix, two, fix number two, it's a little bit more general. We are not trying to focus on this particular withdrawal method because you might extend your account class later with many other methods. You might. So this extensibility is always an issue for your software. So now, we want to solve the issue in a more general way. How do we do that? We want to characterize what a legal or legitimate account object really means. Yes, exactly. That's what we mean by invariance. So according to requirement number one, if you look it up, a legal account object means the balance is always positive. So now, what we want to do, fix number two, we always check, always check that any change or any update, I'll say, any updates will result, will still result, that's more precise, will still result positive balance. Okay? When we say always, in English word, a little bit in a more formal way, we means we treat this condition that the balance being positive as invariance. Invariance simply means it doesn't change. Okay? So now, this is just another contract we're going to learn. We just learned about preconditions. Now, we are, precondition is only applicable to a particular method. But now, when we talk about something that must be always true for the, throughout the lifetime of a particular object or particular class, that's something called class invariance. Okay? So this is uh, uh, also a very important idea to know. Fix number two, we are basically adding something called class invariance. Class invariance. Okay? Actually, you have declared some class invariance in lab number zero. I just, didn't, I just didn't put too many descriptions there. I thought I would just do it here. Okay? Any question about these two fixes? Either way will work, but for the demonstration purpose in the lecture, I'll choose fix number two. I'm gonna declare some class invariance. And the class invariant simply means after every method that might modify the balance, you're going to assert or to check that the balance is still positive. Okay? How do we do that? As I said last time, in this case, it wouldn't make so much sense to do an exception. Exceptions are usually for inputs. So what we will do is we'll do assertions, which will have uh, similar effects. Okay? So now let's just go back to the slides. That's how we move on to version number three. So version number two, we found that there's a missing case for the precondition. So we are going to fix it by adding some class invariance. So let's say we go to version number three. I think that's where we left, uh, left from yes, uh, last time, okay? Uh, any questions before I go on, please? We talk about design by contract, actually, we'll keep repeating different angles of design by contracts. But this, the first week or two, might be the most uh, thorough uh, discussion about design by contract. But we'll mention that from time to time. Okay? If you really got trouble, watch a recording, or please just drop by my office, I will explain to you again. Okay? okay, let's move on to version number three. I'm gonna use some animation here to show you step by step. So now let me go to version number three. So okay, let me just change the slide, pardon. Okay, I think that's the one, yep. 
Okay, for version number three, let's see what's gonna be changed. For version number three, let's go over that. So now you can see, I said for every method that, that is going to modify the balance, including the constructor, because the constructor is going to assign the balance to be the input parameter balance, right? Okay, so that's why we are trying to assert after you assign some initial balance to the balance attributes, the balance should really be positive, right? That's what we are asserting. We simply say assert that this object that get balance should be greater than zero. And I can also add some tag over there to say this is what the invariant is about. That's for constructor. And this another method in this class that can also modify the balance, which is withdraw. So at the end of the withdraw, I also put the same assertion. You can see repetition here. Remember I talked to you guys about what it means when people say your code smells. That means you're repeating the same information over, over throughout your class or throughout your projects, right? So this is not so great, but that will do the, that will do the job, but just not so professionally, okay? Okay, so now let's see what's gonna affect the code for the uh, clients. You can see again, uh, so now let's first justify why version number three is better than version number two. In version number two, we had a missing case, but now in version number three, can we catch the missing case? The answer is, yes we can, yes, because now let's try this. You're trying to create an account of positive initial balance, 100, and then in line number seven, we are trying to withdraw 100 from there, which means we're gonna result in a zero balance. Now, if I just go back to the previous slide over here, you can see that if I try to withdraw and this the balance happens to be zero, zero larger than zero is gonna be false. So we were gonna have an assertion failure, okay? So somehow the adding the invariant does capture this particular error, which means when something goes wrong, there is some contra violation going on. So version three is definitely better than version two by adding the class invariants. Okay, so now, now version number three, is that good enough? Is that really good enough? Okay, I can tell you some drawbacks first, but those drawbacks are not really fatal. I will, I will talk about a fatal drawback in just a moment. First of all, if you talk about assert, uh, for example, in your EEC 2030, you learn about Javadoc, right? How you can generate documentation for your classes uh, that can be accessible from your clients, from any user of your classes. However, if you put the assertion over here as a class invariance, the clients will never know. The clients have no idea what a legal or legitimate state of an account balance is. They have no idea. So somehow these assertions for you as a supplier, you keep repeating the same line for every mutated method. However, such important class invariant or as a contract is never, is always hidden from your clients. The client, they have the right to know what a, uh, what a legal uh, account object is, but they have no idea because assertions are not part, part of the API when you do the Javadoc, okay? That's a, that's a minor drawback, I would say, not fatal. Now, what would be the fatal drawback? Remember, what is, again, what does it really mean to be a bad design? A bad design simply means when something goes wrong and there is no contra violation to report the error, okay? Now, let me just ask you this. Let's focus on the withdrawal method here for the moment, okay? Which I'm gonna show you. Okay, that's just a review, you can read it. Okay, let's focus on the withdrawal method over here, okay? I'm okay with the precondition here. I'm okay with the uh, post condition here. I want you to look at line number eight. Okay? Uh, one moment, one moment, yeah. Maybe you're on the right track, but let me lead the class a little bit, okay? On line number eight, it's quite straightforward. It's almost like a no-brainer. For you to do a withdrawal, of course, you subtract the amount from the uh, balance. You do the uh, subtraction. And it's guaranteed if the resulting balance happens to be not positive, it's gonna be caught by the invariance. However, you can see, as we said before, how the supplier implements the service, we as a client, we don't care. We don't care. Does that really mean supplier can do whatever they like? 
What about we change the implementation a little bit? Let me do this. Why don't we change from minus to plus? Minus to plus. Which means the withdrawal is actually doing something like a deposit. Let's see what's going to happen. Apparently, that's wrong, right? Now, let's say this. Let's say I'm going to show you an example as well. Let's imagine this. I, my current balance is $100. $100. And then I say I want to withdraw $50. And then it's going to pass all the precondition checks. When you get to this line, remember we already changed the implementation to plus. So it's going to be 100 plus 50. So now the resulting balance will be 150. Would it be caught by the class invariance? It wouldn't be, because all that the class invariant cares is whether that's positive or not. It's indeed positive. It's even more positive. However, that's wrong. Right? So the clients would be quite actually uh, worried. Wow, I'm trying to withdraw $50, but now I get $50 more. Wow, that's not good, right? Okay, Do you, anybody got the idea? So my point, uh, let me just finish, uh, summarize. My point is, when something goes wrong, either explicitly or implicitly, there's got to be a contract violation. Otherwise, your design is not good enough. Okay, in this case, when, when we change the, change the way how we implement the withdrawal from minus into plus, which is apparently wrong. However, as the design it is, the precondition is not going to catch that. And also the class invariant is not going to catch that either. So our design is not good enough. We just proved that. Yes? Um, I just want to clarify what you mean when you say that you change the minus to plus. Uh -huh. Exactly. So what I meant, yeah, very good question. So the question was, what do I really mean by minus to plus? I'm trying to say, let's assume we have, we have been talking uh, last time and up to now, we talk about the clients uh, behave well. We have to be fair. The, the supplier must behave well too. The clients, might, the clients might try to use the service in a very weird way. And similarly, the supplier might try to do things in a very weird way too. So we have got to be fair. Okay, so now let me just go to the next slide and you'll be clear. So now, let's say that's exactly a, the, the one I suggested. So now we are moving from version one, uh, sorry, version three to version four. Version four does only one change. We change the original implementation for withdrawal into something that's wrong, which does the plus. However, version four illustrates to you the original preconditions and class invariants are not sufficient to catch, capture this error. So it seems like we need another kind of contract to really to be added in. And this kind of contract should really bind or to restrict the behavior of the supplier. Okay? Which means after the method is executed, you want to make sure the balance has been changed in a way that's logical and that's reasonable. Okay? So whenever you talk about this kind of uh, contract, it's called post-condition. Okay, so that's a third kind of contract you should know. So there are only three kinds of contracts you should know for this course. Precondition, class invariance, and postcondition. Okay, so now we talk about the last kind. Okay, let me just go over this. That's, that's version four. So as I said before, if you try, uh, let's say, uh, let me just show you the uh, example here. And also Java code was available to you. Please feel free to try. Let's try this uh, example here, which will prove that the class invariants and preconditions alone are not sufficient. In this case, we have Jeremy who got 100 as the initial balance. And we are trying to withdraw 50. But now, it's not going to be 50 anymore. It's going to be 150. Because in the previous slide, we said we changed the supply to be some evil one, which will do the addition, right? Not the uh, subtraction anymore. In this case, it's going to tell you that, well, after subtracting 50 from 100, we got 150. Nothing wrong with that, according to the error mess, uh, sorry, according to the console output here. But it's apparently something wrong, but there's no contract violation. So this design is not good enough yet. We've got to add something more, the last thing we need to add to move on to version 5. Any questions until now? Guys, are we OK? Yeah, okay, let's move on to version five. And for version five, so how should we improve version four in order to get to version five? So we talk about post conditions. So post condition is really about, oh, let me just uh, illustrate something to you. So 
So now we talk about three kinds of contracts. Let me just briefly give you some conceptual visualization of them. So that'll be easier for you to imagine. Okay. So now, so we talk about there are three kinds of contracts. In order to think about these three kinds of contract, think about what's going to happen during the lifetime of an object. Okay. So what about, let's say, lifetime of an account objects. So, for the, uh, I'm, so all of you have taken 2001, the uh, automata course already, right? So you know how to draw DFA, right? If that rings the bell, okay? Now, let's draw the DFA, very easy DFA. If you try to do something like this, if I say, for example, Alan account, Alan is assigned to a new object of type account with 10, for example. Okay, let me just extend this a little bit longer so that'll be better. Okay, so this means as soon as after this object creation, we have at the very initial states. Okay, in this case, the balance is equal to 10. So, okay, so far? And then, let's say, let's also imagine we also got deposit, so it's easier to think. Deposit and withdraw. If you try to, let's say, Alan dot deposit, so that's some action. So all the arcs, all the transitions means a method call, and all the states means the combination of the attribute values. That's why we call it states, okay? So now, after deposit, let's say $10, so now balance should be equal to 20, okay? Let's do one more. So let's say we also try to withdraw. It will say Alan dot with, sorry about my writing, withdraw, let's say, uh, let's say 15, okay? In this case, it's gonna be balance is equal to five. Okay, that's so far, let's say. That's so far, that's uh, the, the lifetime of the, this Alan object so far. Okay, let's now try to talk about the contract. First of all, class invariants. Class invariant is very easy. I'm going to use, uh, first of all, I'm going to write down the uh, contracts. We got class invariants. Class invariants, and also we have precondition, and also we have postcondition. Class invariant, let me use maybe uh, yellow, okay? Class invariant here. So when do we check for class invariance? We basically check for every state. Every state, we check that the class invariant is satisfied. 10, positive. 20, positive. 5, also positive. So, so far, the class invariant has been maintained. So far, so good? Okay. Every time we do the change to the to Allen objects, we check it. That's class invariance. What about precondition? Precondition simply means there has to be some obligations for the, for the caller, for the client to meet before they can make a method call to, to Alan. For example, let's say for the constructor here, when we are trying to make a method call of this, okay, that's the very first method call we made. I'm going to use green. In this case, the precondition is that 10 is greater than 0. If you look back to our constructor precondition, right? The, the balance, the initial balance you assign to the object must be positive, right? So that's a precondition. Every time before you, you execute some method, you want to make sure the precondition is met. Otherwise, you don't allow it to be executed. Another example here, let's say over here, over here you can see we are trying to do deposit. Deposit over here. Now, what's the precondition? The precondition, ah, uh, deposit, uh, unless we have a maximum, how about we do withdraw? Okay, let's do withdraw. That's something we are familiar with. What would be the precondition for the withdrawal? So here you can see the current balance for Allen is actually 20, and we are trying to withdraw 15, right? So the precondition is whether 20 minus 15 is actually still greater than zero. If it is, then we satisfy the precondition, okay? In this case, the precondition is that 20 minus 15 is 
greater than zero? In this case, yes. So precondition also satisfy. Okay, that's about the precondition. So now, what about the post condition? Again, it's about the timing of checking your contracts. For post condition here, I'm going to use a different color here. Let's say this color here. Post condition. Post condition means you're going to check it after every method, after a particular method is executed. And every method might have different post condition. Okay. So now let's say for this particular example here, let's say for this one here. So what should be the post condition for that? Think about this. If I say I want the supplier to initialize Allen with initial balance 10, then what should be the post condition? Yeah, there should be an account with for Allen that has initial balance 10. That's a post condition, right? So in this case, this is a post condition because you are trying to assign some initial value 10. Indeed, it is 10 afterwards. So that's a post condition. Okay? And how about for deposit over here? The current balance is 10. I'm trying to deposit 10 into it. What's the post condition? Well, it should be 10 plus 10. The current balance plus whatever amount you want to deposit. So in this case, it's really checking that. Sorry about that. Okay, let's now, sorry for the interruption. So now, let's say for this post condition here, it would be whether the current balance, which is 10, plus the amount we want to deposit will be equal to the new balance, which is 20, right? So the post condition here is really that the post condition over here is 20 is really equal to 10 plus 10. Indeed, it is, right? Any questions until now? Okay, one more, just to strengthen it. So now let's say this. So let's say we want to check the uh, post condition for withdrawal over here. What should be the post condition? You can see the post condition for withdrawal is different from the post condition for deposit, right? For withdrawal, you want to rec you want to say that if the if the balance before withdrawal is twenty, and I'm trying to withdraw fifteen. The resulting balance should be 20 minus 15, which is 5, right? The old balance minus the amount we want to withdraw, which will be 5, which is a new balance. On the other hand, for deposit, the relationship between the old value and the new value is actually a plus, right? So the post condition for each method might be different, but the class invariants are all shared by all the uh, um, states. Is it clear? Okay. Yeah, sorry for the, uh, uh, the diagram being so messy, but if you try to watch a recording, you will see how it gets so messy, so hopefully you can uh, get it better. Okay. Any questions, please, before I move on? Yes? Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, it's a very good question. Basically, I will try to go a little bit further with that, okay? Let me just use a different diagram. So somehow you got, you got a kind of a, this diagram clear, so let me just add another one. Let me just write some little bit of code and then to show you. So now let's say this. I'm gonna write some code here, very simple code. I would say account, Alan is new account, let's say 100. And then I'm going to use deposit and withdraw. So now I'm going to have deposit. How about two withdraw, since we are talking about withdraw more. How about just two withdraw? withdraw. Let's say 20, and then after that I say withdraw again. Allen dot withdraw. Okay, let's say we are going to execute these three lines of code one by one, only three lines. Okay, so now let's say this. So now I'm going to say precondition using green. I'm going to say post condition using blue.
Okay? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, don't worry about it. It's actually just the uh, iPad. It's not the uh, active presenter. Don't worry about it. It's recording. Yeah. Okay. I know you you really want to watch a recording, so I'll make sure it happens. Yeah. I know everybody is king. So guys, you know, I really want to make a recording for you so you can study that afterwards. But don't think uh, you will just uh, pay less attention in the class. You know, still try to engage, right? You want you don't want to waste too much time uh, watching the recording after class. Right? <coughs> anyway. Okay, let's first think about the precondition. Before we execute, I'm going to write it on the left hand side. Before, precondition is going to be green. Before we try to do this account creation over here, what's the precondition? It should be that the 100 should be larger than zero, the initial balance, right? That's a precondition. Okay? Now, after this, I'm going to use a different color on the right. After this, the post condition should be Allen dot balance is equal to a hundred, right? Now I think uh, he, now we'll get to your question now. Okay, so now immediately after this, we're going to call a withdrawal method over here. Now what would be its precondition? The precondition should be that the current balance of Allen, Allen dot balance minus 20, if we do that, is going to be larger than zero. In this case, Allen the balance, as we know, is actually 100, right? So now we can replace that by 100. 100 minus 20, which is 80, larger than zero, true. So this precondition is satisfied. So what about we try to do, what about a post condition over here? So the post condition would be that Allen dot balance is equal to 100 minus 20, in which case that would be just 80, right? Which is 80. Okay. Let me just do one more. Okay. What what's the precondition for Allen dot withdraw? Again, it would be Allen dot balance minus 20, it will be larger than zero. However, the current balance has been changed to 80. So which means this part is 80 compared with 100, right? Because depending on where we are during the lifetime of these objects. So 80 minus 20 larger than zero. Of course, 60 larger than zero. So the precondition is again satisfied. So now when we go to the uh, post condition for that, over here, we want to say Allen dot balance is equal to it's going to be um, 80 minus 20. In this case, it's going to be 60, right? OK, that's about precondition, postcondition. Now, what about class invariance? Class invariance basically is going to say, I'm going to use red. It's going to check for every resulting value for the balance. 100, 80, and 60. They're all satisfied. They're all positive, right? Is it clear? One more diagram. One more diagram. And then we'll move on. Add the page below. Let me make it a little bit more abstract, a little bit more. Let's say over here, let me just say given any objects. If I say Objects, let's just OBJ, okay, any objects. Objects of, and then we are trying to call a method called M1 with some value over here, okay? And then I'm trying to call another, ob, uh, another method called on the same objects, M2. I have two method calls over here. Let's see how the interleaving will go. Let me, I'm just kind of generalize the situation over here, okay? So now, first of all, for precondition. For the precondition would be, the precondition of M1 is satisfied. Okay? Because I'm trying to make a method call on M1. So the precondition should be specific to M1. After that, I should check that the post condition of M1 is satisfied. 
Okay? And then, now, right before I'm trying to make a method call on M2, I have to make sure that the precondition of M1, sorry, M2, is satisfied. And then, after M2 is executed, I gotta make sure the post condition of M2. So that's M1, M2 is satisfied, right? That's about the pre and post conditions. So they are somehow, depending on which method you're calling. One more, invariance. When do we check the invariance? Basically, we will check it together with the post condition. That's how Eiffel does it, okay? Or any decide by contract tool should do. So we're gonna say, remember the conjunction operator that you learned from 1090, right? That means P1 must be true and P2 must be true as well. Let me just use a conjunction here, okay? Very easy, just more precise. So that's conjunction. So when we check that the post condition of M1 is satisfied, at the same time, we also check the invariance is also satisfied. Okay? And now when we check that the post condition of M2 is satisfied, again, we also check if the same invariance is also satisfied. Okay? So precondition and post condition are very specific to a particular method. On the other hand, the class invariants are specific to a particular class, not just to methods. It's more at the class level. Yes? Uh huh. So, That's correct. So the class invariant is checked after every method. That's correct. Exactly. Or, you know what, another thing, I'm so glad you asked me this question. Let me state another fact to you. Hopefully this will help you understand again. So, we can really say the following, which is true. You can really think of, think of the invariance is the common post condition of every method. Now, remember I said for your code not to smell, you don't want to repeat everything, right? So now that's why if this particular condition is gonna be the post condition for every method, why don't we factor that out to the class level to be an invariance, right? So class invariant, the, way, the one way to think of it is class invariant is basically a post condition for every method. That's why we say it should be an invariant that should really be independent of your methods. You should always be true. Yes. Ah, yes. I agree with you. I agree. Not for this example, I, with, I, I agree with you. But I tell you what, you might, oh, I can give you an example right away. So the question was, it seems like, it seems like, it's a very good question. Very good question. I tell you, I'll restate the question here, and I tell you that in general, no, it's not the case, okay? So the question was, let me just put a uh, Java code over here very quickly. Let me make it even dumbier, okay? If I say a method called increments by some value, integer value, over here, and let's, and then I will simply say, for example, let's say I got some attribute i, I'll say i plus equal, let me just make it even more similar, is equal to i plus v, okay? What I would do is I'm gonna say assert. Somehow the i is equal to, I will say the old version, okay, I'm just gonna conceptually, the old version of i plus v. So the question was, it seems like the post condition over here looks identical to the implementation over here, right? That, that was your point, right? I agree. For this particular example, that's absolutely true. 
However, when you get to the more serious routine that you want to write, it's not the case anymore, and you really appreciate the contract. Let me give you an example right away, okay? Let's see one example where the contract will be much simpler to states than the implementation. Sort. How, how many sorting methods have you learned so far? Only two? Really? No, 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 no. Uh, if only two now, I will tell you what, I think by the end of your degree, you should learn at least five or six. Okay, let me just tell you my point here. Okay, let's now th think about this. Let's say I have a sort method. Sort, let's say I have integer array, and then x over here. So now, let's say I'm gonna have two parts. One would be the implementation. The other part would be the post condition. In this case, just by the way, would there be any precondition for this sort method? Can you think of? Can you sort anything? Any precondition for me? There's an array. There's, oh, yeah, which means the, the array is not null. Yeah, it's a, there's a reference to the array, right? Okay, that's good. But other, other than that, it doesn't matter how sorted the array is. You just want to sort it eventually, right? Okay, now, now let's think about how the implementation is going to look like. For example, you heard about quick sort, right? You heard about merge sort? You heard about selection sort? You heard, you heard about insertion sort? What else? Huh? Did, that, did somebody say bubble sort? Ah, bubble sort. I know. Yeah, it will be interesting. Bubble sort. I tell you what, bubble sort is not the way to go. <laughs> if you're interested, I don't have time to show any in the class. Go to my website. There's something called links. Under the links, there's a YouTube video there. And it's called uh, Obama claims that bubble sort is not the way to go. <laughs> Please go to that link. You will find it interesting. He was interviewed by Google. Anyway, uh, what about heap sort? Heap sort, right? OK, that'll be enough. So which means for the implementation, you can, there are many possibilities for you, right? But, but somehow, I can, don't you agree? For it, every one of them, you got to write some complicated if statement, loops, and manipulate the array. And the manipulating the indices will be extremely complicated, right? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that's not doable, but I'm just saying it's much more difficult, OK? Now, what about the post condition? Yes. Uh, OK, of course it's sorted. But how would you state formally that an array is sorted? OK, x1 is less than or equal to x2. Exactly, exactly. Let me just write it down. This is something you are expected to write as a contract in IFO later, which I will show you. But remember, uh, I hope you remember this operator, right? What's that? For all. Very good. I'm proud of you. Proud of you. Let's say for every i, such that 0 less than what you call to i, less than uh, x dot length. What am I doing? Valid indices, right? It is the case that I will say minus 1, because you will see why. And then I would say x of i is less than or equal to x i plus 1. That's the contract for, that's the post condition for an array sorted. Don't you agree? There are two things. First of all, you definitely agree. It's much, at a much higher level of abstraction. You don't have to worry about loops. You don't have to worry about if statements. You don't have to worry about manipulation of your indices, right? And it's actually much more mathematical, much more precise. Of course, for efficiency reason, you can try to do the, of course, not bubble sort. You can do the, in the most efficient way possible to have, I think for comparison sort, you can be n log n. The, that's the best you can do, right? You can try your best. But now, contract is another issue. It's about to really define what it really means 
for the supplier of the sort to provide a satisfactory service, in which case we don't care how you do the sort. As long as it's sorted, I don't care how you do it. Yes? So my question is, uh, when you're Yeah, we're talking about two things. Very good question. So I'm not trying to ignore the uh, runtime. Please don't get me wrong. I'm trying to say there are two issues over here. Okay, there are two, uh, let me just add, uh, I think I'll mention this again, but let me just add it now. So there are two issues over here which I would like to stress. Whenever you're trying to write programs in any language, hopefully not iPhone, after you graduate from this degree, right? So let's say, first of all, number one is correctness. Number two, efficiency. Let's say this, you as a client, you asked me to give you a sorting algorithm. I said to you, well, I can give that to you. I can give you a big of one constant algorithm. Why? I just print out hello world. It's very efficient, constant time. But is that useful? It's efficient, it's constant time algorithm, but it's not correct, right? For any algorithm there, if it is not correct, it doesn't matter how efficient it is. It's like you claim that your sorting algorithm is gonna achieve better than n log n, but if maybe that's not correct. Maybe you'll miss some cases. Maybe you just re, uh, misorganize your elements. So correctness is number one issue there. And for this course, we focus on correctness. For contracts, we really want to make sure you have a notion of correctness. So what about correctness here? Correctness over here is really about what to achieve. What to achieve. So when we talk about what to achieve, you really talk about what kind of contracts you have. Like the, uh, ex, uh, the universal quantification that we did in the previous notes, right? On the other hand, when you talk about efficiency, it's really about how you achieve it. So for example, if you want to implement a linked list, you better do a linked list using, a, well, not a good example. You're trying to, let's say you're trying to implement some, like a tree. You have the uh, option of either using a linked list, singly linked list, or doubly linked list, for example. In this case, you may have to tweak your performance to see which one's better. That's kind of your consideration, given that your code is correct. So correctness always goes first. To really make sure your code is correct, you must have contracts as a reference point to know if anything goes wrong, the contract is gonna be violated, right? And then you worry about efficiency. For this course, we don't really evaluate your code for efficiency, not really, unless you have infinite loop, right? In which case, of course, that's definitely not correct. Yes, question. Exactly. Supplier. Because the supplier, let's say, if I am the person who, uh, let's say, if I'm the person who's maintaining the account class, I'm responsible for make, making sure the account balance is always positive, right? Because you, you as a client, rel you rely on my account service. If I simply maintaining some illegal account, of course, me as a supplier, I'm to be blamed. Right? So then should compare the Yeah, so there will be some notion of contract violation for sure. Okay, let's not worry about how it is thrown. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Please. I'm actually very glad about your asking me all the questions, which I don't necessarily include in the slides. Maybe later the slides, but not at the moment. So we, we can talk about these issues. Any questions before I move on? Okay. Okay, let's now go on to, go back to the slides. So we talk about post condition here. So now we talk quite a bit of, of that. So now when you try to do divide, you want to make sure the result is the result, which is why well, you want to do x divided by y. For example, uh, eight divided by two, you want to make sure the result, which is four times two is back to eight, right? That's kind of the relation. That's just a simple example. And if you do want to do binary search, that means you really found the elements, right? So over here, you can see this arrow here, what does that mean? Imprecation. I will review the uh, logical operators. If not today, I'll do that next Monday. Okay, so let's not worry about this one just yet. It will take some time to explain. 
Okay, so now in Java, the best we can do to check post conditions at the end of every method for a particular method. Sorry, let me take it back. If you want to check the post condition for a particular method, you have to put an assertion at the end of that method. Okay. Okay, so let's see how we can do it. So now, now you can see there is a very inconvenient point. Remember, let me go back to the notes very quickly. Remember when I talk about how we do things over here, you can see I use something called old over here. If you want to compare, let's say you want to do the post condition for withdraw. If you withdraw $50 from $100, so the old balance is 100. The new balance is 100 minus 50, which is 50, right? So somehow you got two values for the uh, balance which you want to compare, right? You want to somehow draw a relation between them. In Java, the only way you can do it is to say, before I try to do the updates, I capture that value and name it elsewhere. And then after I do the updates, I'll compare the new value with the old value that I just captured, right? It's not very convenient, but it's doable. Imagine that if your post condition has to involve many, many attributes, let's say 10 attributes, then you have to do 10 lines like number four. You should always maintain a separate copy of the same variable, the same attributes, right? In this case, before I try to do this the balance is assigned to this the balance minus amount. Before I do that, I have to capture that value, right? But let's say I got 10 other attributes. In this case, I have to ten, need to have 10 such lines to store that value there. Okay, now in this case, what should the post condition look like? You can see that we assert the current balance, which is after the withdrawal, is equal to the old balance which we capture before the updates occurred. Minus the amount can be anything that we pass, right? So now, would this post condition here, the thing we added to this version here, would it capture the error that we had before? The mistake that we introduced in the previous version was, we say with a withdrawal, rather than using subtraction, we use addition, right? Would it work? Let's try. Let's try, I'll illustrate it to you. Let me just do that over here. Let me just use a new page over here, and a page below. Okay, let's just do the withdrawal. So we have the withdraw integer and the amount. Let's not worry about the precondition at the moment, okay? So we know that at some point, we're gonna do the uh, updates. So let's say this is the incorrect implementation that we did, okay? And before that, we're gonna capture the old value. Let's say integer, the old balance is assigned to this dot balance. And then we do some incorrect implementation there. I'm gonna use a different color here. Let's say we simply do balance is assigned to balance plus the amount. Okay? And now we do the post condition. The post condition is gonna be an assertion. Assert the new balance, this dot balance over here, is equal to the old balance minus the amount. Okay, that's the assertion. So again, this is the wrong implementation that we introduced. This is the pre, oh, sorry, this is what we have to capture beforehand in order to do the post condition here. Okay, that's a big picture. So now, let me just run the code over here as well and show you. If I try to say something like this, I say Jer uh, account, let's say Jeremy is assigned to new account, let's say 100. And then I say Jeremy dot withdraw 50. 
Okay? So now we know that when do we check the post condition? We check the post condition after the method is executed. Okay, let's see what's gonna happen here. I'm gonna use red. When we try to execute this particular method here, so we know that Jeremy is the current object, right? So Jeremy is going to be this. Okay? So Jeremy the balance, what's that? Before we call the method, it is 100. Okay? So O balance is going to be 100. And then, and then what we did was, let me just fix the microphone. And then we do the incorrect implementation. So we say balance is assigned to the balance, which is 100 plus, so we here got 50, which will be 150, right? So that's a new balance. Okay, so now the new balance over here is 100. And we know that the old balance that we store is 100. Is 150 equal to 100? No. 100 is the correct balance that we expect. 150 is the balance that actually is uh, calculated using the wrong implementation. They, mis they don't match. So we're going to have some assertion error. Okay? So that's how the post condition is going to signal a, a contra violation in this case. Guys, questions? Is it clear? Huh? Say that again? Withdraw 50, yeah. Withdraw 50, that's correct, over here. So you would expect withdrawing 50 from 100 should become 50. But somehow the wrong implementation will calculate 150. So 50 is not equal to 150. So you get a post condition violation, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. Let me just say uh, for this example here, the main reason is if you don't have any post condition to really constrain the way that a supplier is going to implement the service. In this case, the supplier can simply just do addition rather than subtraction. In this case, a class invariant is not going to capture that. So we're going to need something more. And we're going to see later, maybe uh, in the second or third week, we're going to see that writing a very complete post condition is very challenging. I'll show you the issue. Especially, guys, please, one person talking at a time, please. Okay, a little bit distracting. Okay. So later on, we're going to see that if you have an attribute of type array, in this case, it's much more difficult to write a complete post condition. But we have to learn how to do it. Okay? Okay, any questions? You can see, even for a simple example like this, it's already getting a little bit complicated. The design by contract idea is it's itself complicated. And the way you do the inter indirect encoding in Java just make it even more complicated. So why do we have to complicate our life? Why don't we choose a language that will natively support the precondition, postcondition, and class invariant right away? So when we learn about the ideas, it's much easier for us. So later on, if you really want to go back to program Java, of course, but with the design by contract in mind, it can also make you a better Java programmer. That's really the rationale of choosing a language, not really Java at the moment. Yes? Uh, don't quite get your question. What do you mean? Say that again, please. How do you choose whether to make, so say you want to test to see if the withdrawal increases the effect. Mm -hmm. How do you decide whether to do that as a post condition, or do it as a separate test later on when you're testing all the tests? Yeah, that's a good question. Think about this. So we are trying to document the surface that we're interested in. So we are trying to document, so the surface that we're interested in is the withdrawal method. So somehow, you better keep all the documentation in one place. You don't want to have the precondition documented here and the postcondition documented somewhere else. So in here, you can see the way we are trying to do in Java, we use exceptions for the same method as preconditions. We use assertion for the very same method for the postcondition. They're in the same place. So when the clients, when they actually try to look up the information, they can, they can go to one single place to go. Right? Yeah. But for Java, it's not that simple, right? Because if you try to generate a Java doc, only the exception will be thrown, will be shown in the API, but the assertions will not be. 
So somehow the post condition information is lost, right? So even though the supplier is trying to encode some post conditions, but the clients would never know about them because it wouldn't appear public, right? So that's again why doing the side by contract is not so great in Java. Questions? Uh -huh. Oh, no, okay, I see what you mean. Think about what the post conditions are. The post conditions are, first of all, the obligation for the supplier. At the same time, it's also the benefits of the clients. So that means me as a client, I should know what exactly my, my benefits are, right? If I try to give you an amount that's a positive and also not too large to withdraw, at the same time, you tell me what my obligations are, you should also tell me what my benefits are as well. Otherwise, you might just give me a piece of nonsense, like uh, the plus over there, right? So I wouldn't know what I'm really getting, okay? So basically, for every one of us, not only that we, know, we need to know what our obligations are, we also need to know what our benefits are, okay, both of them. We shouldn't miss uh, any information there. Yeah? So I guess it could be like um, you're creating a password for a website, and the website doesn't tell you what your password needs, but and keeps on telling your passwords wrong, or like when you're trying to come up with one, and you don't know what it actually requires. So that way, you need to know on your end what you're supposed to pass over at the end. Of the well, it might be a little bit, uh, maybe not this way. So you're trying to say maybe the you know, website is supposed to tell you how to get a password, or, or tell well, you what it's expecting in general. Well, uh, to, to me, intuitively, if you're trying to use a password service, what what's really the service you're trying to achieve? Security. So you want to make sure, let's say you, you are the owner of the website, so you know that, you should know the password. But now for me, I'm not a user. So the surf, what the service should do, you shouldn't give me any hints because I'm not a user of the website. No, I was talking yeah. more along like password when you're creating your account. When you're creating your account. And, it's, and let's say it's have a capital letter, have this, have this. Mm -hmm. all yeah, exactly. Oh, you're trying to make one example. Yeah. Yes, thank you, yes. So let me just repeat, repeat what you said. So your name? Michael? So what Michael said was another example for precondition. Let's say you try to create your password for Passport York or username. Usually it's not really like any, let's say for username, what would be the precondition for username? Uh, six letters. Six letters or maybe no special symbols and? Okay, there's some reserved keyword you cannot clash, what else? And also, this should, should not be another user using that already, right? That's another precondition. And password as well. It's going to be enough characters, cannot be too long, cannot be too short. You're going to contain some special symbol, etc. Again, that's a precondition, right? So precondition and postcondition are everywhere. So that's really why the decide by contract idea is really useful. Okay. okay, so now, let's now see where we can get to. So that's a post condition here. Okay, so now if you try that, now if you try to do 100 plus 50, which is wrong, and it's gonna be caught by the post condition assertion. Okay, so now you can simply go through this. I'm just summarize what we have done so far for version one to version five. And then I also summarize what's really bad about using uh, Java exceptions and assertion altogether. You can go through the point. I think we have gone through every one of them. Guys, no, 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 it's okay. I'm still got five minutes, okay? So don't, don't rush. We got important stuff to mention very quickly. Okay, so you can also go through this. Again, please have a look at over here. We say that in general for the clients, the benefits should be the post condition, what's guaranteed. And also, you can make sure the invariance, which means uh, some valid states, is always maintained, right? And, and symmetrically, that should be the obligation for the supplier. Okay, again, we talk about how indirect or how inconvenient it is to do this by contract in Java. So that's why we need a new language, iPhone. Okay, why is iPhone good? To learn design by contract, iPhone kind of gets rid of the scaffolding that we are trying to build. No exceptions that you have to create, you have to create. No assertions, assert, you have to write. They just got very clear keywords, and they just got to state the Boolean condition for the precondition, postcondition, and class invariance. Okay, so that's somehow what we can achieve. Okay, so that's uh, the iPhone 
I will go through this uh, next time. However, I would like to just point to you a slide, which I would like you to go over first, because this one I think for you to begin with, your best window of opportunity before lab number one is, is from now until next Monday, uh, sorry, until next Wednesday. I did, I made this slide for you, so that's for you to really compare the syntax between Eiffel and Java. So, for example, I'll just make one example for you. You see lots of uh, uh, comparison over there. Do make, take advantage of that. So for example, let's say, how do you, I will talk about the logical operator specifically on, uh, on Monday. That's actually more confusing. And I want to talk about just, for example, how do you create objects, okay? This is, let's say we got an account class. This is how you do in Java, use a new keyword. And so what's the critical information here? The class name account, and also the argument 10. In Eiffel, we also try to include account class and also 10, but the syntax is different over here. We're trying to say create an object of this particular class called account, enclosed within curly brackets, and then we say the name of the variable like here, and although we say make. Make here is actually the constructor name. In Eiffel, the constructor name does not have to be the same as the class name. Okay, there are many, many bits and pieces you have to look into. So the slides are already on the web. Please go through that, and then um, by Monday, you have to go through all the slides. I think I will pretty much cover everything. Try to complete num lab number zero. If you got trouble, let me know. And on Monday, we'll finish off and then move on to new topic. Okay.